when I saw that, my question was, um, what was the budget like? Did uh, the police department have enough in the way as far as being able to hire more officers? I also took a look at the fact that they hire one out of 17 of their applicants that are coming through, which means that they, they are definitely trying to make sure that they have um, quality officers. Um, but it seems as though there has to be some other underlying reason. It could be very well that it's a small community and uh, individuals may feel as though they can advance quicker and further if they were going to larger agencies. And so as a result, that's why they may be looking for it. Um, I know that a number of individuals who went to Northern Arizona University, African Americans who came out that were majoring in criminal justice, in some other areas and had worked with NAU uh, Police Department um, that they had left. And so I'm, I was trying to wrap my, my mind around um, what was it that the maybe Flagstaff Police Department needs to do in order to try to bring in not only more officers, but also more African American civilians as well. Um, I took a look at the, as far as the arrest record to see exactly where they were. And it appears that um, it's 2.3% African Americans in the Flagstaff area. Shoplifting was the highest um, area whereby individuals were being arrested who were African American at 6%, disorderly conduct and aggravated assault at 4%, uh, domestic violence at 3%, and all of the offenses were either 2% or lower, um, which was uh, something that was positive. But, for me, especially when you, you have a background as far as community-based policing, I take a look to see what else is going on in the way of um, city funds going towards uh, libraries, going towards schools, going towards after-action programs. And here again, I go back with regards to, to officers, and that is, do we have enough officers for the purposes of not only school resource officers, but also uh, PAL programs, DARE programs, great programs, those programs which will introduce our youth to those uh, to the um, field of, of law enforcement in a very positive way. Um, I can tell you I used to do any town programs for years in Prescott and one of the things that we would always ask the students and that was um, do you know of any good police officers and because so many of them saw them in such a controversial role arresting their mothers their fathers their brothers sisters uncles and aunts um, they said the only ones that I knew that were good officers for school resource officers, dare officers, and great officers. And so this shouts to law enforcement as far as um, in order to have that long standing relationship that we need, that community relationship, uh, whereby not only the accountability that is now being demanded upon uh, law enforcement in the way of body worn cameras and early warning systems and the like, but in order to establish that we have to do it at a younger age. The other thing as far as bringing our, our community in um, I noticed that they have the process as far as being hired. And my question was whether or not there's an opportunity for citizens to sit on the oral, um, oral boards. Uh, where this comes into play is when you have individuals that are able to um, say, I, when they see an officer, I remember when, I hired, when, when we hired you. And they, they take a second look and says, oh yeah, it, here again, relationships are so very important when we we're looking at um, how to police our communities better. Because a lot of times, and, I, and while I was up there, I used to, used to hear from uh, Sister Davis, she said, oh yeah, I know that officer. I remember when he was born. I remember his mom and his dad. And um, I just called him up and I said, hey, can you go and get my son? Or can, can you go and get uh, uh, help out this individual? And it was a matter of going and talking to uh, individuals as opposed to arresting individuals, which went a long way. But the criminal justice system isn't just police. And this is where a lot of people have to understand. It starts when you make that first phone call. So my question is, even though police officers are going through implicit bias training and the like, how about the civilians that are in the department? Are they also going through it as far as communicating with individuals and making sure that they're on top of the um, cultural issues, especially the contemporary cultural issues that are going on today? Um, it takes it so far as then from, uh, from the individual that is receiving the call to the dispatch, uh, are we sending out the right individuals and the right, and I, and I love to see the, the critical incident um, stress uh, teams that are, are working um, in order to um, de-escalate situations involving mental health. I, I, I really commend that. But then I also look to ask what is being done as far as making sure that our police officers who go from um, scene to scene to scene to see things that a lot of us really don't ever wanna see 
I can tell you right now, I'm burned on the back of my retinas that I will never forget. Um, what is it that we can do in order to help them as far as their emotional state so that they too can keep their families and, and don't find themselves victims of, uh, of uh, alcohol abuse in particular um, and, um, and divorce? Um, I then take a look to see what's going on with our prosecutor's office. What, what is happening with regards to the representation there? I would love to see the statistics. I'd love to see the statistics with regards to the number of cases that they are filing um, and the outcomes of those cases, whether they're pleas or, or no contest. Uh, just recently on September the 1st of this year, the um, National Registry of Exonerations came out with a report called Government Misconduct and Convicting uh, the Innocent. And they were showing that half of uh, the wrongful convictions came about because of government misconduct. And that was both police as well as prosecutors were concerned, forensic scientists as well, as far as the evidence is, that was being um, provided. I then would, would like to take a look to see um, what is the makeup of our defense counsel? Are we using court appointed attorneys? Are these individuals too taking the time as far as um, different um, trainings? A lot of times when it comes to attorneys, being one myself, I've been a prosecutor, I've been in the police department and now I'm doing criminal uh, defense as a contracted attorney. I can tell you, we'll say, yes, we're turning to our state bar association or our county bar association for our continuing legal education credits, and we always have to go through ethics, but are we going through those classes that actually are important as far as contemporary issues today? Are we going through issues that deal with the hashtag me too? Are we going through issues that, that are dealing with um, Black Lives Matter as far as cultural awareness, as far as um, the, the communities that we serve, um, which is so very important? Our judges, what I found when I chaired the um, Arizona Commission, um, Minority Commission uh, for the Supreme Court, was that a lot of judges, when we first said, it's time for you to go through cultural awareness training, they said, no, it's not. We're judges. We don't need that. <laughs> it's like, just because you're wearing a black robe doesn't mean that there may be biases within you as well. And um, luckily, uh, Chief Justice Lackett at the time said, we shall do that with our, at our judicial conference. And we found where there was a whole nother attitude as far as that's concerned. There, there are books that have been written. I've taught classes for Arizona State University um, as well as Northern Arizona um, on issues dealing with leadership as well as criminal justice that show that um, it's important that judges are also um, kept up to date as far as the system. It takes us then to the, the intake and detention. And I'm trying, I'm going through this very fast. I know that I am, but they only gave me 15 minutes as opposed to 15 hours. Um, I, when I look at the detention system, are we doing the same thing with regards to taking a look at what our representation are, the, the representation is, the training they're going through. I want to see the inmates in there. I can tell you three weeks in as a, as a county attorney, and I primarily prosecuted street gangs and occult criminal activity when the state was denying we had a gang problem. I wrote the gang statute that we currently have today that's been with it, able to stand all sorts of uh, appellate challenges. But after three weeks when I walked in, I saw nothing but African-Americans and Latinos on the chain gang, I said, is it really justice or is it just us? And I was the prosecutor because I just could not understand how the court system could be filled up with so many people of color. I just, it, it, was, it, it was just beyond me. So it takes, when I, I take that to the, to the detention, um, um, what is being done there? How is it being handled? Are we working on, and I know our system in Arizona is more of uh, dealing with uh, retribution as opposed to rehabilitation. Um, but it takes us back to some other things and, go, and it's almost full circle. We not only talk about the children, what are we doing with regards to housing? So many individuals are out on the streets right now um, in every community. I don't care where it is. I was in Salinas, California, doing work with DOJ there as well. Every community. Um, what are we doing in the way of jobs? What are we doing in the way of um, after school programs? What are we doing in the way of trying to help families um, that are navigating through not only the coronavirus, which is something that we're dealing with right now, but just with life itself and the impact that it's had on us. Uh, Flagstaff has taken the lead as far as um, uh, minimum wage in a lot of ways, which has been very helpful. But how has COVID-19 affected that? Um, I'm throwing a whole lot out here right now, but when you look at the criminal justice system, please remember something. I saw it just the other day. It said, um, they were talking about law enforcement. No police, no peace. Law enforcement works hand in hand with us as far as trying to make sure that we have safe communities. 
But it's like I told them, I asked the, the, the ministers in Ferguson when I got there, I said, how often have you invited them to your churches, to your events, and taken the time to try to get to know them as well? There is, there is responsibility on both sides. And when you have a badge and a gun, your level of responsibility is so much higher. But there's also responsibility in our communities. And I think that this is what we're trying to do with this town hall. And that is to say, we're reaching out to you as well, saying, get to know us so that you don't fear us and so that we can work together for a safer Flagstaff. Uh, thank you, um, Reverend uh, Richard. Uh, excuse me, uh, Kara and Warren, I just need to step in here for a moment. And I totally forgot um, to include Northern Arizona University Department of Ethnic Studies as one of our partners. I'm not sure how I did that because they have been a partner for the last probably 10 years or so. Um, in fact, one of their professors, Dr. Ricardo Guthrie, is responsible for the mural that's on our building. And so I have to apologize to them. And I'm not sure how I forgot them, uh, but also want to make sure that we that I recognize them. And also, um, Alpha Epsilon Sigma is the name of the alumni chapter in Phoenix of uh, Phi Beta Sigma. And so I wanted to make sure that I corrected that. And so uh, thank you very much. And with that, I'll turn it back to Karen Warren. All right, thank you, Ms. Deb. Um, and, um, and we're uh, at this point, uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Mr. Richard. Uh, always eloquent, always informative. And I think that myself along with everyone else, they listen to you talk and then you talk about what you've done and how long you've been doing it. And we're all in awe. And at this point, before we go to our breakout sessions, uh, we would like to open it up the floor to the audience and not us, but if they want to ask you any specific, uh, if you have any questions specifically for Mr. Richard. Uh, hey, Brother Warren, may I start? Absolutely. Thank you, Brother Guthrie. Hey, y'all. Um, I just stepped in late. I'm sorry to miss the beginning, and uh, my apologies. Uh, Reverend or Pastor Richard, um, there was a major uh, settlement recently in Louisville uh, with the family of Brianna Taylor. And one of the things, aside from giving money to the family, obviously mm -hmm. that can't compensate somebody's death. But what the Louisville police force thought to do was, let's make some reforms in how our policing relate to the community. And one of the suggestions was they give incentives if the police force actually has a home in the community. So the hope is that you'll see the person on a daily basis, as you mentioned, and it's not so much a form of policing, but a form of community building. Can you comment a little bit on some of the initiatives across the country that have been used to create, let's say, incentives for police, uh, peace officers, what I like to say, to be part of the community as rather than uh, an occupying force. What, what's your thoughts on the success of that approach to incentivize home engagement, uh, et cetera, to make the policemen or police women or peace officers part of the community through things like that? I can tell you that is extremely critical. Um, in Phoenix, we attempted to do something along those lines, especially in our um, uh, hot spots, as we call them. Um, we had a number of officers that took advantage of that. A lot of the officers were single officers who, um, you know, they didn't have family, um, but they um, wanted to be able to be a part. <laughs> and what's interesting, a lot of those officers continued to work in areas where community-based policing was, um, at the forefront of uh, the department. I think that that's really good. I think it, it, it is very helpful. Um, one of the things I used to always say when I was initially with the Phoenix Police Department and ran into some um, opposition was, um, I don't care where the officer comes from initially, they need to go and they need to spend time and learn about that community. And I had some who would say, so you mean to tell me that a white officer needs to go learn, learn about white people? I said, Yes, because they may not be the same white people as that officer is. And they, they're like, I don't understand. Every, each and every one of us has been raised in a different um, 
cultural environment, moral environment, um, I don't care what color we are. And one person in one house may be raised completely different from the person in the other house. But it's important for us to take that time in order to get to know uh, our different cultures. I'll give you an example, more so, even more so than just, just living. <sighs> when I started Citizen Advisory Boards with Phoenix Police Department, we initially we should reach out to our Native American community. And we made some mistakes. Um, we called for a meeting on Columbus Day. Mm. Now, we learned quick. Um, and then we finally sat down and had the meeting. The chief was very, he was a little con concerned because only three people showed up. And I said, you don't need everybody to show up. This African-American community, they would all come out. Native, Latino community, they would all come out. You'd have a whole room full. Didn't need that with the Native American community. You just needed a few. They'll take the word back. Well, one of the things I asked at the time, I said, is it possible that we can, members of the Phoenix Police Department can participate in sweat lodges? Nothing was said. I asked a second time, nothing was said. I asked a third time, and my dearest friend, who's passed away now, Winetta Lone Wolf, she said, do you think you're warrior enough? And I said, I'm from the south side of Chicago, bring it on. And she and I became friends. I can tell you, I participated in at least nine sweat lodges, was, was, uh, was responsible for the fire in the last two that I did. But I had an opportunity to take members of my community, the, the police community, and to share it with a department that had never done that before. We participated in Native American Recognition Days. And one of the officers who said to me, said, he walked up to me, he later became one of the assistant chiefs for uh, uh, Gila River. And he said to me at the time, he said, never breaking a smile or anything. He said, this has never been done by our department. Keep up the good work. And then he kept on walking, you know. Um, we have to reach out. We, and when I say law enforcement, we have to reach out the criminal justice system. We have to step out of those roles. We have to, to come out with, in our uniforms. We have to eat the hot dogs and the fried bread and whatever it may be that people are cooking and let them know we care about you. We want to get to know you. Um, so yes, living, getting, getting back to you, living in the community is critical. Why? Because if I go to the same Safeway that you go to or the fries that you go to, it says, well, how's the, how's the oranges this week? Well, I wouldn't get them. Not here. Go over to, to uh, the Costco and, and get some. It means the world because Warren and I, Warren came from California. I'm from Chicago. When we first met each other, I mean, both of us grew up in, in, in gang riddled neighborhoods, but we were able to find a piece because we sat down and we found our commonalities. And there are more commonalities that we have than we have differences. Thank you, sir. I think there's some questions in the, uh, the inbox. And we have a question from Eric Nolan. Eric, if you want to go ahead and unmute yourself and you can ask your question. Thank you very much. Uh, first, I want to give a shout out to Brother Warren. Uh, I grew up in Carson, California, right down off of Avalon. So I just want to give a shout out to your brother. <laughs> Banning Pilot, baby. That's what's up. Oh, for sure, man. My, my uh, friends growing up went to Banning, and uh, it was either that or Carson High. So anyway, I just want to share that with you. Um, <laughs> so my, my question uh, for Pastor Richard, um, I'm running for Flagstaff City Council, and recently uh, I interviewed on a Facebook Live event Dr. Luis Fernandez, who is a criminal justice professor at NAU on the terminology funding, reforming, and uh, is, I think somebody's mic might be unmuted. Can you hear me okay? Okay, good. Um, so uh, yeah, recently I uh, interviewed Dr. Luis Fernandez of NAU, who uh, is a professor of criminal justice, and we were going over the terminology of defunding, reforming, and disbanding the police and, and these sort of big ideas. And, you know, when you get into sort of the critical aspect of it, what does it mean? What I'm curious to hear feedback on, because I want to make sure that I temper this conversation, because I know when I first heard the word defund, it made me pull back because I'm thinking like, you know, does that mean we don't have a police force anymore? You know, what would that mean? And then when you actually dig into it, it's just more looking at, are we allocating resources uh, in the right areas? So I was wondering if you can maybe speak to that a little bit. Is there, is there something in the language of defunding the police that's too strongly worded? Or is that something that we can start to begin a conversation of what's appropriate for a police officer to respond to 
as opposed to say a social worker? Thank you for the question. I tell you, I, um, that hit home a few, uh, a few mayors ago here in Phoenix. Um, one mayor in particular talked about how they were moving all the funding over to law enforcement. And a dear friend of mine who was um, um, one of the, the assistant city managers, he said to me, well, then you all do it all. And I said, what do you mean? He said, if you all are receiving all the money, then you all go ahead and take care of all the utility issues. You, you all go ahead and take care of all the library issues. You, and then I started taking a look at the holistic approach based on a community-based policing. And I started not only your, the word defunding, but the word you don't want to hear is depolicing. You don't want to hear that. And so when you look at the words that you use, they're very, it's, it's like talking to somebody you love. You make sure that you use words that are not hurtful or, or deceptive. You use words that can help us to move forward. So when I look at it, as I was sharing with you when I first started off, and that was, I looked at the number of officers that we had, that we have in Flagstaff, and even though I find it to be an outstanding um, agency, I'm saying, where are the other 0.5 officers that the rest of the state would have? Why is it we aren't able to utilize that like we did during the Clinton administration where over 180,000 officers were specifically des designated for community-based policing, whereby we were able to go through and do all sorts of, of phenomenal programs? So defunding is not, um, I should say, a term of art that we should be using at this time. But when we look at terms like reformation, we talk, we're talking about more practices and policies. And one of the things that, that I used to do when I was teaching classes, in, um, in service classes in Phoenix, was when we were talking about racial profiling and I would walk into the classroom, I would initially be hit with somebody saying to me, oh, so, so they're saying we're racist. And I said, no, I said, not at all. What we're doing is making sure we stay at the cutting edge so we don't have the Department of Justice coming in here telling us what we need to do. So we look at a holistic approach, education, homelessness, areas as, as far as um, learning, as far as substance abuse and rehabilitation, and we take a look to see how we can do this collectively. That is what's so critical. A lot of people want to throw out some terms that are very hurtful right now. What we need to find are those terms that are going to bring us together. And defunding is not one of them. Um, I, I would rather work on reforming um, and rehabilitating our system so that it will benefit all of us. Thank you. By the way, since I have everyone on here, let me ask you. How many of you have attended a sweat lodge? Get to know your community, please. Well, thank you for that. And thank you uh, everyone for your questions thus far. We are uh, having a little bit of an issue with the ability to make, move us into breakout rooms. So we are instead going to engage as a, uh, a full group to go through the questions that are presented uh, on the uh, policy brief paper that was provided to everyone. So we have uh, several folks who are here to help us serve as uh, facilitators who will help us with documenting some of the, um, the comments that you guys make and uh, any questions going forward that you have as part of this dialogue that we're going to engage in. Um, what we're hoping for as part of this is to spend some time with uh, the questions that are on the form and to engage you all with uh, with those so that we can uh, come back with some um, some key points that we're taking from this conversation, um, some good ideas that we can um, fold into a, a policy that we're going to work on from this topic um, and just uh, have some good notes to move us forward in these conversations that we're going to have. Can I start? Absolutely. All right. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Edward Lumpkin. I'm also uh, with Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity Incorporated. 
And uh, it's certainly it's a pleasure to uh, be with you all. Um, I'm going to, I like to do things a little unorthodox, so I'm actually going to go out of order in terms of the questions. I see, I'm going to, I'm going to cherry pick the question I like. Um, so if you don't mind, um, question number three, what do you feel needs to change in order to ensure continued positive development of the Flagstaff community in the area? In Can this area, me? my apologies. Couldn't hear you, Ed. Okay, go ahead. Can you hear me now? Yeah, can you repeat it one more time? I think sure. you've moved away. All right. What do you feel needs to change in order to ensure continued positive development of the Flagstaff community in this area? Can everyone hear me? All right. So don't everyone speak at once. Well, you know what? I tell you what, I like to call upon people. So, um, Mr. Guthrie, do you have any uh, insight with that? You know I do. I'm Wait, hold, hold on, Dr. Guthrie. Before before we call on you, because right. uh, you, you, we have already heard from you, and if any of you guys ever get a chance to meet Dr. Guthrie, this, the guy's just like walking – Wikipedia. You know, you ask him about what's the relationship between the stars and the inverse hypotenuse of whatever, and he'll break it down for you. So I just want you guys to know he's there, and and I really want to pick on some of our other folks here. So because I, I just wanted you, you exercise my 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 privilege as one of the co-moderators, and I noticed Jennifer and Colin are here together. So since they are so bold and they want to join in together, then I'm going to pick on them. And you guys have to be the first ones to answer Ed's question. Go ahead. Would you like for me to repeat, repeat the question? Yes, please repeat it. Absolutely. All right. What do you feel needs to change in order to ensure continued positive development of the Flagstaff community in this area? So we're talking about positive change. What 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 do you think needs to uh, continue as far as to uh, um, to have for positive change to occur? I think for for us, I mean, it's already been kind of uh, mentioned is um, opportunities of rehabilitation instead of retribution. Um, we had the experience of somebody who trespassed into our home uh, while we were home and um and it was uh you know in the end it was scary at the time but in the end it just it became obvious it was a neighbor that we didn't know which is already like problematic already that we take we can take responsibility for that um but um you know and it was really really drunk and um uh, mistook our our uh, place for his place and he had hit his head so he, there was blood all over our apartment because he had blood on his head and put blood handprints everywhere and slept on our sofa. And, um, but in the end, how many years were they going to give him? Six or, or it something? was several years. It was, yeah, I can't remember exactly, but it, it was, it, it was, was much higher than, than we thought was reasonable, far beyond reasonable. And we wrote a letter to the judge and to that, you know, person and asked you know, we, and expressed that we felt that this was not appropriate and, you know, to have, that this person obviously had some problems that needed to be uh, addressed and we didn't feel that putting this person in prison was really the appropriate response to what, what happened. He never threatened harm against us or anything like that. And, and I think looking back to it would have been really nice to have somebody who, you know, I wouldn't mind of have, having had a conversation with that person that, that broke into our home and having that chance to create these kinds of um, relationships. And um, I think that would have been a, um, a good experience for that person and, and a good experience for us as well. You know, one okay. of the things that, I'm okay. sorry, go ahead. Well, one of the things that comes to mind in this um, conversation we're having about this particular incident that that I found so frustrating in terms of the, the previous, you know, one of the things that has been brought up about was the process, you know, and the different aspects of the criminal justice system. And one was that 
you know, there were many, many hearings uh, regarding this case. And I was, uh, we were being notified of these because we wanted to attend. Always postponed. And, but they were always constantly being moved, constantly changing times, dates, changing. So because of the kind of job that I have, there was no way for me to kind of deal with this moving target. So there was really not an opportunity for us to participate um, in, in this process as far as this individual. And as Jennifer said, it would have been really, um, I wanted the opportunity to, to um, participate in this process, not again, for, for restorative justice purposes, not for ret retributive. Um, you know, because we, we both didn't feel like this person deserved any prison time at all. Um, and, and yet he was facing this prison time regardless of our wishes, which was really frustrating in itself as well. Um, and anyway, so um, more work on uh, restorative justice would, would, um, would be a really nice thing to see. Um, yeah. Absolutely. And I, I think that that's one of the things that Mr. Richard was referring to when you're talking about, you know, you hear it's not an, an issue of defunding is the, when you reallocate resources, what about victims? What about helping the, 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 the criminal justice system streamline itself? So you don't have to get delayed hearing, moved hearings, and you could be a part of that process. What about the, the victim impact statements? That's what they refer to it as, you know, where you, your voice is actually heard. But, you know, you look at the sentencing guidelines, and Mr. Richard knows those all better than me, but there are certain sentencing sidelines that carry mandatory uh, punishment. And so we have to look at th those types of reforms as well. And in what situations where there's latitude. So all those things is exactly what you're talking about. Excellent, excellent comment. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Nolan, I'd certainly like to pick on you. Um, same question. Um, what are your thoughts in terms of how do we continue the positive change in our community? And, and, and certainly uh, with you being from, you know, the, the West Coast area, actually, I'm, I'm from uh, the inner city of Broadside, Chicago. So I, I'm pretty sure some of the similar situations that, that you encountered uh, where you're at, uh, where you where you grew up is probably the same um, issues that I, I had as well. But just some share some of your thoughts on what do you think that, you know, we can do to uh, encourage and continue positive change? Thank you for the question. Um, I think the biggest thing that I've seen is um, really changing the whole narrative because one of the things growing up in LA that was a catch-22, especially in the early 90s, is when gangster rap came out. Because on the one hand, it was raw, it was real, they were just speaking about what was happening in the streets, but then simultaneously, these record companies saw that they can make a ton of money and just plastered that image all over. And that's unfortunately how a lot of people perceive, you know, a lot of people in the black community. So for me, my whole neighborhood was uh, black over by Cal State Dominguez Hills. And I think part of it is just switching up the narrative. I mean, you know, people can say and have their opinion of uh, President Barack Obama, but one of the things that I felt that he did was just put out at least a positive in image so it starts to shift that narrative a little bit because that's been one of the hardest things for me as a white man and especially moving out of LA to Flagstaff and just seeing what that represents now where people automatically assume X, Y, and Z about me just because they think that I'm not associated from where I actually grew up, which was very much embedded within a black community. So I think part of it is just rewriting uh, that narrative. And like this group is, is a perfect example of, you know, there's so much diversity and by showcasing that there's diversity among black people, about, among people of color, I think helps to do that where now we start to bring out more of the human aspect where instead of seeing somebody for the color of their skin or not seeing that you transcend it you recognize what it means to be black in america but you also recognize 
that we're trying to look at each individual based upon their unique characteristics. So, so yeah, that's that's just something that I would say is you know I'm I'm also participating because uh, I'm here to listen and I'm also here to learn about the community specifically in Flagstaff, um, which is very different than you know what I grew up in LA. But obviously, a lot of the same underlying issues exist. So. You know, you brought up something that I thought was was pretty uh, profound. You mentioned, uh, you know, from what 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 I, I caught was almost like hijacking the narrative in terms of there were um, there was a, a group or there were um, an organization or just individuals that can take something, kind of flip it, and make it make it um, kind of kind of redirect what the actual intent is, again, with the gangster rap, how do you, how would you correlate that to the, the Black Lives Matter uh, message? And again, I know this is off topic, but you kind of brought something that I think is, is a good point. Yeah, so for my, in my experience and my perspective, the Black Lives Matter movement is such a great example because I am like a diehard uh, BLM supporter because, you know, growing up in the streets and just, you know, not only seeing what my, my, friends and family had to go through, but now seeing that, you know, this is on scales that is, it's, for lack of a better word, profound, but I see a lot of um, people who don't understand the Black experience, and all they want to do is pick apart BLM and say the founders are associating with communists in China, and like, they just totally reroute the entire narrative where, but that's not the point. If you look at what the supporters out here are saying, all we're saying is, we're still dealing with these systemic issues. We're still dealing with prejudice and discrimination. And that hasn't gone away. And these are issues that we're still trying to address. So, so that's one of the things that I've seen that um, I see a lot of people that are taking the, the Black Lives Matter movement and moving it into spaces that's really not at the heart of what that message is all about. Thank you, you know, um, I'm just gonna try and pull us back on um, on topic. I know that we've got a lot to say, but we also have a number of questions that we really would like to get through um, so that, and this isn't how we wanted uh, this uh, particular uh, event to happen. We're still having technical problems getting people into Zoom, into their rooms, and hopefully for the next, I shouldn't say hopefully, for our next uh, virtual uh, Zoom, we will have this issue worked out. Uh, but for tonight, uh, we've got about oh, 30 minutes left, and so I'd like for us to really get through the other questions if we can, okay? Sounds good. Well, do you want me to uh, uh, give someone else the floor so they can ask their questions? Sure. Go, go ahead. Yeah. All right. Mel, would you uh, like, to, like to go next? Okay. Uh, actually, Mel, if I may... Um, uh, uh, Kara, I'm sorry. Yeah, Kara, Ms. Kelty, you're you're a member of the school board, correct? Yes. And and which which particular school board? Flagstaff Unified School District. So, since you are on the school board for Flagstaff Unified School District, and you look at question one, actually, it's it's, it's really question one and question three. When you look at the primary uh, social and criminal justice concerns of the black community within your district, and I'm not, sh and, and actually I would like to know if you know the percentage of, of, of black students you have in your community, uh, what do you feel are the primary concerns facing those students within your district? Great, well, thank you for calling on me. I just wanna let you know, I did have my hand up in the little participant chat. So <laughs> I, was, I was ready for you. Um, I just wanted to follow up on what Colin and uh, Jennifer were saying, and I wanna say, hi guys. Um, what, what I wanted to say before they went and what their story reminds me of is the issue I think we face within the school district and in the city is who do we give the benefit of the doubt to? And I, I also want to share that I was on, I served two terms on the Flagstaff City Council and I had, you know, a, a terrific relationship with the police department. Um, I have great admiration for what 
uh, police officers do. And I feel there's a lot of similarities between the police officers in the school district where we're on the front lines of social ills and deficits that are not being addressed and doing the best we can with stretched resources. Um, I also volunteered for years with Victim Witness. Um, and so just to summarize a couple of these questions, um, I was recently pulled over by a police officer because my bike rack was blocking my license plate, which seems very odd in Flagstaff. Um, and I almost always have my license on me. I didn't have my license on me that day. So those two fines, and it was November of last year, were over $500. And um, fortunately I contested one and I was found guilty of the bike rack blocking my license plate and it was dismissed. But you know, if I'm a single mom and I have to pay that fee, like I would probably be evicted, you know, like you're coming into Christmas and the holidays. I mean, it's just, an, it's an excessive fine. Um, and you could see my license plate, but anyway, the judge found me. <laughs> so I'm just saying, uh, also, when you look at the original fee, the original, uh, you know, violation was like $13 and then you compound all the fees. And so, and, and this was something coming out of Ferguson that we saw. This is what's happened to our budgets because of all the anti-tax rhetoric. We shifted to user fees and then we shifted those fees to certain people. And in Ferguson, it was found by the Department of Justice that people of color were pulled over more frequently and given more tickets. And then if you can't afford them, there's no payment plan. So if you can't afford them, then you default and then you're always behind. And so, you know, that correlation you know, and then we hear in the news when there is an issue, the first thing we hear is, oh, there was an outstanding warrant. Like that person is already guilty. Um, and so we, we really have to look at how we're structuring fees, how we're providing public services. And then the second thing I do wanna say, I didn't have personal experience with the African-American community and policing, but I do, I have seen a lot of bias in our community with Native American, uh, citizens. And, and I'll just give an example. You know, I came upon someone who was unconscious on the pavement and I called uh, dispatch and they answered. And I said, I have, there's someone in front of me who's unconscious. And the first thing they said was, are they native? They didn't say like, do you need an ambulance? What do you need? And, and that was, you know, really disappointing. Um, within the schools, we see it. Uh, I, and so looking at the population that you provided, for the community, the schools are very different. Um, our pop school population is 26% uh, Hispanic and 25% Native American. And some of that is because we have the Kinlani, Kinlani dorm that houses a lot of students who go to Flag High. Um, and when I work with students, they do say they feel, particularly Native American students at Flag High, they, they feel very separate and not, um, they, they feel like there's segregation. They don't feel like a cohesive, part of the community. And that's sad because these are students who they're living in a dorm. Their parents aren't there to go to, you know, their conferences or to go to their school events. So, um, um, Kara, I, so specifically in, in terms of, I, I get the 26% Hispanic, 25% native. What is the African-American population of your school? I want to say it's 2.8%. It's hovering around three. So two to 3%. And, yeah. and when you Let me go, look, I can look it up while we're talking on the okay. Department of Ed. And then your earlier comments when you spoke about the fees and, and the different things like that has, so with the, with the population that small in Flagstaff, are you, is it your point that because here you are, if you look at the, those fees and you're not in those populations, but then you look at some of the underrepresented, underrepresented populations, the impact is that it's too much of a greater extent? Yeah, I'm saying it's an undue burden. It was getting back to like, who gets the benefit of the doubt? Okay, okay. So say, and, and you know, and it's also tied with poverty, right? So you buy the car you can afford. So you buy a car that might have a broken taillight or there's judgment made because, you know, the fender is um, knocked in or something. And then you're constantly getting pulled over and constantly getting more fees. So like, how do you uh, dig yourself out of that? And then also how do you, that then informs how you feel about the police. Right. Okay. Because you're you're like, oh no, if I it pulled over again, I'm not going to make rent. Um, so, it, and that's not the Flagstaff Police Department. As I said, in you know, when I study political science, this goes back to that whole anti-tax rhetoric, 
And so no, no politician wants to raise taxes. Right. So instead of raising taxes, they raise fees. Okay. And, Thank and that's demonstrated by, like I said, a fee that was originally $13, but then in the end was $175. That's all surcharges. Right. Thank you very much. I, I, and I really appreciate that. I want to move to uh, one of the young guys. I, uh, I'm going to call him Ricky Young next. But what one of the things that's unique to Flagstaff, especially with the African-American population, every year there's an influx of new students. And the African-American students are coming from areas usually outside of Flagstaff. So at this point, I know that Ricky, uh, Ricky Young had his uh, hand up. Ricky, you have the floor. Can I speak on any question? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Please. I would like to speak on question two, just because I have had a direct experience um, with law enforcement and Flagstaff. So um, basically, before I went to college um, at NAU, I grew up in Phoenix. <clears throat> and I started driving when I was um, 15 and a half. And I had never been pulled over until I got up to Flagstaff. Um, so the very because I've been pulled over three times. Um, well, I was pulled over three times in one semester. Um, before COVID hit and we had to go home, obviously. Um, but I believe it was the second time I was pulled over. Um, the police officer had been following me already for two to three miles. And I felt like they were waiting on me to like mess up or do something. So I'm just making sure I'm doing everything right. And then I had, um, I was in like a turning lane, but I had went straight. If you get what I'm saying, like you were supposed to make a left, but I just went straight and went like through the light. So then I had got pulled over and I was in the car with my friends, obviously. But the first question I was asked, like, before anything else, because I was assuming, like, they were going to ask for my license and registration before anything. But the first question that they had asked me was if I had any drugs or alcohol in the car. And, like, granted, it's a college town, so I'm like, maybe that's, a, you know, an appropriate question. But then after, you know, I said, no, there's nothing in the car, the second question they asked is if I own the car. And I was like, well, yes, I do. I have my registration. If you would ask for it, like I'll, you know, reach for it and give it to you. And it was just, it was just an experience for me and obviously everybody in the car, because I'm trying to just do everything I can to make sure like I'm not getting arrested for something that we didn't do. Like, even though it was something as simple as turning the light. And she, like the officer had drug it out. Like we were literally there for 45 minutes. Like she drugged the whole process out for no reason. It was just asking an unnecessary question that didn't have nothing to do with the reason why she pulled me over in the first place. What, you know, thank you for, for that, uh, Ricky. Um, is uh, Mr. Musselman still on, on the call? I can't see, let me see. Uh, Dan, yes, Dan, Dan, you're there, thank you. So, um, and I haven't personally met Mr. Musselman. But I can tell you by the mere fact that he's here on this call and, and from my work with the city of Phoenix and working with, especially with Gerald, one of the things that, that, that we have to do whenever we see something, and we're talking about law enforcement in this context, but if there's something wrong and there's an appearance of something wrong, you have to know that people are approachable. It's just like uh, Jennifer and Colin were talking about their access to the system. That system is there for us. Greg Cleveland talked about giving his, his email. We have to be about change. And when we see injustice, and if you personally, if you feel that there was some injustice, you should know that. But one of the things we talk about community if you don't know where to go, and, and that's one of the, 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 the key cogs of the Murdoch Center is that, you know, we have to make sure that we are presence in the community. We know if you have questions, we, not may be able to, we may not be able to solve it for you, but we can at least tell you where to go. We can let you know that, hey, you can go to the police department. Now you can't just walk into the chief's office, but how do you access him? How do you access the city manager? Do you understand the council and how it works? How do you get assistance? So if you go back to Jennifer and Colin, who do they call to say, hey, wait a minute, I'm frustrated. Yes, I'm a victim, but this process, now I'm a victim because of this process. I'm here, I'm tr just trying to help, but I can't even help and I don't know where to go. So I, I want you to know that 
for your experience, Ricky, I mean, you did well to come out of it because one of the things we do is want you to come home alive. But I think it's important that people out there who are having issues, no matter where they are, have an avenue. And, and I want to turn this over to uh, Mr. Musselman so that you can respond to this and provide some perspective from the top. Yes, excellent question. Thank you for the opportunity. And there's several ways to access your police department, email, phone, and, and website. And additionally, right here, uh, Deborah Harris is on our Citizens Liaison Committee. She's brought comments and concerns to us several times. My boss is here and Mr. Greg Clifton, as well as two city council members and many other people I've worked through throughout my career. So we do choose to be accessible. And Ricky, I apologize if that was our officers because that is not the way we do business. We are to introduce ourselves, tell you the reason for a stop, and then see if you need help or what's going on. So if that was I apologize and I can look into that further. You just reach out to me tomorrow or shoot me an email and let me know. That, what sometimes does happen though is people um, don't communicate well and they say, hey, I saw this car. These people were in my neighborhood. I've never seen that car. They were selling drugs. And the officer just happens to be on his way to a shoplift, sees the car and says, well, it's here, I'm here. I better stop it or I'm gonna be accused of not doing my job. Hey, but, but in that case, they wouldn't have kept you there for 45 minutes. So that makes me think something else is amiss. But yes, those, that, those are the ways I can be accessible. As far as if it's a victim thing, uh, the county attorney is on here and his office is very approachable as well as victim witness services for Coconino County who has advocates that work for victims of crime. So your victim advocate can certainly speak for you if you feel you do not have a voice. Um, and that, that, is, that is unfortunate for Jennifer and Colin. Thank you very much, you. Mr. Mus Musselman. And you actually provided the perfect segue. I want to go to Mr. Ring. Mr. Ring, I, I, I really want for you to kind of describe, I, I know we talked about who you are, but who you are and what you do. But when, when we're looking at th this whole thing is we're, when you look at this, the small population of African Americans, but the disproportionate representation and the adverse aspects, I'm not going to just talk about criminal justice. You got social justice and community issues as well. How, what have you seen in your role as it relates to the African American uh, experience and that you know of? And you may not be able to speak to it, but we're trying to make sure that everybody understands here's a small population, but there are these resources that we may not know, and there may be some things that we aren't aware of and that you could somehow assist in changing the narrative. Please. Well, I, well, thank you. Um, thank you, Warren, and, and you know, greetings to everyone uh, on the call. I appreciate you uh, turning to me to ask those important questions. Let me address Jennifer and, and Colin just for a second. Um, I know that your experience was was perhaps a poor one, not, not only that you uh, had a person invade your space, but that then the criminal justice system seemed to turn in a way that you weren't expecting or perhaps uh, was, was you know, deaf to your concerns. Uh, and so if there was some injustice in that situation, I'm the person you can call. Uh, if you have a victim uh, difficulty with a case, now in your particular circumstance, you know, the, the other things that we consider when we talk about how to approach a, a proper disposition is criminal history uh, of the individual. And also if there's other multiple offenses that have been committed that haven't been adjudicated, uh, but are waiting adjudication, sometimes they, they get resolved all at once. Uh, and there's a lot of other considerations, but victim considerations are one of the most important priorities uh, for our office. And if we could do a better job, I apologize to you for that. Uh, and you can talk to me tomorrow, uh, call me um, at my office and we can sit down and discuss. Now, when you speak about, uh, to the question about disproportionate, um, I, I wanna explain one thing that we do, that we, we, we struggle to do, in fact, uh, but we're working on you know, this week and, and into the future is trying to get uh, young people of, under, of an un underrepresented nature 
uh, whether that's you know, African American or Latino or uh, Native American introduced to the law uh, as, as a field and a career. I mean, it's for the same reason that we would like to embed law enforcement officers in neighborhoods as a part of community policing. We would like to embed those, those cohorts in fields of law, including our office, uh, so that the young people can be introduced to not only what we do and how we do it, but that in your life as a young person, you've got decades of contribution to make to your community. And, and along the way, particularly in the law, not only in the law, but particularly in the law, you have the opportunity to be a change agent. Uh, and and that, ha that comes to you by virtue of not only your skill and the license you have to practice law, but something that's called the exercise of discretion. Uh, and so many times when you, see, you hear about these these stories that, that seem to, to grind against your sense of justice, it often is a result of someone exercising discretion somewhere along the way. So we can introduce people to these careers, you have an opportunity to exercise your discretion, you know, as you apply it to certain situations and circumstances, in our case as prosecutors or as attorneys that advise uh, Coconino County in the business of being a government, the last thing I would tell you that we try to do uh, is hire into our office as well. Not only recruit for internships, but hire into our office uh, people with underrepresented and diverse backgrounds. Uh, I want to tell you, I go to law schools to do that recruiting. I do it personally in Arizona. Go to ASU and U of A every year to recruit for underrepresented and diversity populations. Um, and I got to tell you, those individuals are not well represented even in law schools, right? And those that are in the law schools are treated like rock stars. Um, and what I mean by that is that the large firms, the private firms are also trying to balance their representation in their offices and they can pay twice what we pay uh, for the same recruit. Uh, so we're trying to compete against communities uh, and particularly the private sector for, for students uh, and, and career workers uh, who are being recruited heavily uh, by others. We have, we struggle uh, every year to, to recruit into our space. Uh, and we can talk about, you know, how wonderful Flagstaff is. We, we have to admit in full disclosure, it's one of the most expensive places a person can try to start a, a career uh, at half the, half the salary and income that others can pay. So we've really got a headwind, but that's where all of you are important because you can make a difference if you can introduce people to who we are and what we do, send them our way. You know, I'm, going, I'm leaning forward and outward, uh, but you can also participate by introducing me and us to people who you think uh, would, would be, you know, worthy candidates for, for positions and, and, and uh, have information that we can use. The last thing I'd say to, to Pastor Gerald, it's interesting. Uh, I know you, it, it sounds like you have a wonderful diverse background and you practice law, it seems on both sides uh, of, of the courtroom. Um, I just reviewed this morning a proposal for a rule change uh, with the state bar uh, continuing legal education requirements for those of you who are attorneys on the call, you know that we're required to get three credits each year for ethics. But there's a proposed rule change that I just read today that requires half of that credit, 0.5, all right, but half that credit to be directed to diversity and inclusion training. And it's partly to make uh, lawyers, by and large, a Caucasian population uh, introduce those lawyers to, you know, implicit bias training, structural bias, um, and, and that bias, by the way, is inclusive of, uh, you know, gender choice um, and uh, sexual orientation, uh, a, a wide variety of what, what we talk about when we talk about diversity. So th there are these institutions that are trying to move in that direction. But Warren, I would tell you that it's really difficult to, to, for persons who are not of a minority nature 
to see the structural bias all around them. It's like you're looking at it and you look at it every day, but you can't see it, right? It doesn't depend on what you look at. It depends on how you see what you look at. Uh, and so, you know, it's, it's a difficult task that we have before us. I was talking to Miss Deb a little earlier. I mean, Miss Deb, teach me these things. Would you teach me these things? And I've decided, you know, I've, I've come to this revelation, Miss Deb, uh, that I've got to educate myself on this. There's enough information out there. I, I don't need to relearn it, and you don't need to teach it again. I mean, you might need to, to, to provide the community relations just like this, the lived experience. But as um, a public official, I've got a duty to educate myself on these things. And so I'm appreciative, Warren, for the question. Okay. Uh, and, and I'll turn it back to you. I'm going to try and get us back on track a little bit because we've got about eight minutes left. And I, I just want to say that, you know, while we're sensitive and we're concerned about, um, you know, other issues, but we're really wanting to look at the relationship and the lived experience of Black people in Flagstaff. Um, and we can all agree that, you know, we have a lot of issues in our society and we have a lot of issues in Flagstaff. And so for the next eight minutes, for the next eight minutes, can we just talk a little bit about um, the Black lived experience in Flagstaff as it relates to social and crim criminal justice? Um, and we're not just talking about you know, police, we're talking about the whole gamut, the system. So, so what um, can we offer in terms of comments regarding the Black lived experience in Flagstaff as it relates to criminal and social justice? And I just want to note as we're going into that, the, these next eight minutes, I see that um, the person noted as KD has had their hand raised for a moment, if you want okay. to unmute yourself. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Greetings. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Khalid Durham. I'm a member of Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated and represent uh, our social commitment to justice and bridging uh, communities. I'm also a director of Emotional Intelligent Design. I'm also a, the former chairman of the Diversity of Commission for the City of Flagstaff. And so uh, just to, uh, as Ms. Deb was speaking, and just to speak on the Black lived experience, particularly here in Flagstaff, but also in this country, the work that I do takes me from Chicago to Detroit, to New York, to Los Angeles, to do implicit bias training, to do uh, coaching and therapy with families that have been affected by trauma, um, trauma with violence, trauma um, with interaction with police. Um, as a citizen for the last uh, 10 years plus of Flagstaff and traveling all over, I can say as a black man, my, uh, let me make this quick, my, my edge that we all experience as people of color when we're in different cities is much less in Flagstaff because of the fact of the relations. Part of the work that I do and what I like to remind people is we need to, moving forward and addressing questions one through five, moving forward, we need to use our personal relationships to make things better for our community as a whole. Um, I have a relationship with, with uh, Chief Musselman. I have a relationship with different council persons. And so, and I also uh, am aware of our, of our, of our city dynamic. So if there's injustice or there's situations that happen, we all have to be responsible for bridging that gap. Um, that's something uh, 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 Mr. Brown was alluding to. And, and that's something moving forward we need to understand. We also need to understand overall, it's bigger than racism. We're in a caste system. We're in an American caste system where at the bottom of that pecking order is because of history, the black man is placed at the bottom of that pecking order, at the bottom. So when we saw something like a George Floyd happen live, it wasn't how was he murdered, it was how was that officer able to do it so arrogantly, with such confidence, and not feel like he was going to be challenged. Had that been a 
terrier or a poodle screaming for eight minutes and 46 seconds, there would have been um, immediate outrage at that moment because those officers would have felt responsible when they got home. So moving forward, it becomes incumbent upon us and our personal relationships and our business relationships and our community relationships to make sure that we hold value for persons of color, right? And uh, that means that we hold it socially in our social circles. That means that we are aware legislatively, legislatively, excuse me, of, of issues and topics that impact people at the bottom of that caste system. Here in, 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 in Flagstaff, we make up, as the Black population, we make up 1.9% of the population. The ind indigenous population is 12 to 15% of the population. So while we are uh, dealing with the overall systemic racism or the, the caste system, you know, we do recognize that here in this particular community, that youth, that youth incarceration or that, that school to prison pipeline affects indigenous students on a, a greater percentage. And so now we have to move forward looking not at it, not as this system separate, but looking at this system as who's affected the most representationally, who receives the the worst treatment of this system and that's 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 black people that's because of anti-blackness in this country and so understanding that we also understand that the original sins of this country was robbing the indigenous folk of their land so they could enslave the african folk on the land and so moving forward we need to make sure we address those things in totality, not necessarily separate, but looking at how it's a complete system. Because if we keep looking at it separate, we'll never, never get to the actual root of the problem, which is the caste system of this country. Thank you, guys. Thank and you very I much. Would, oh, I, just wanna, ahead, I just want to. I just want to wrap. Uh, just kind of. Uh, just kind of bring us back, and we've got like one minute. And so I think I have a personal relationship with most of the people that are on this um, panel or on this Zoom. But what we need for you to understand is that the African-American, the black population is yes, is 1.9% of the Flagstaff population. Uh, we are three less than 3% in the school district. I get that. But what people are not seeming to understand is because that population is so small, they have become invisible, mm. that their yeah. needs are not being heard, that yes. their experiences are being overlooked. And that's why we're having these conversations is because we want people to understand that there is a population in Flagstaff that is so small that people have discounted their needs and their concerns. And that's where we have to get back to. It is not that other populations are not important and that they do not have issues and concerns. We all get that. We totally understand that. So what I would like for us to take away from this and to think about uh, when this is over um, is to think about those Black people that you may have come in contact with and that you may know and to think about their experience or what you think their experiences might have been in Flagstaff. Think about how small that population is and how it feels to be invisible, okay? And so we wanna be really respectful of people's time. And so I'm gonna ask uh, our two uh, project coordinators to uh, go ahead and kind of wind this down, uh, let people know when the next session is and hopefully we're gonna have our breakout rooms all figured out so that we'll be able to go to breakout rooms. Please encourage your friends or anyone else that you know to join this conversation. It is not only for black people, it is for the whole community, but we are definitely looking uh, to get the responses from our black community members. So thank you.
Thank you so much, Ms. Deb. And before I turn it over to my counterpart, Kara, who will bring us home, I really, really want to uh, bring uh, Dr. Guthrie. Uh, I promised him that he would speak, and I really appreciate him deferring and allow, allowing others to speak. Uh, I have taken note um, from the individuals who have spoken here, and I'm glad that, first of all, all your comments were absolutely amazing. And I think that we're going to, as we continue this series, you're going to see a, a, a paradigm develop of where we're going. And I really, really appreciate you guys. And this is the first of, of six. So we're, we're coming into this and please continue to follow uh, along with us. But there are some specific things for Mr. Ring and Mr. Musselman that uh, off, off, uh, off this platform, we have some resources for you and we can help push that agenda along and exactly what we're talking about. But I do want to turn it over to uh, Dr. Guthrie before deferring to Kara. Dr. Guthrie? Oh, no, that's, that's all good. I just wanted to say there were some questions about the percentages and I was saying it might be less than 3% officially identified as black in uh, Flagstaff, but there's also a category called undisclosed and also two or more races. And that percentage ranges from six to 10%. So the actual percentage of blacks in Flagstaff may be as high as 6% because we aren't counting on campus black students and we aren't yes. counting the two or more categories. Um, but I'll tell you what, you can be black and indigenous and be treated like a black person very quickly. Um, you understand what it's like to be black. So I, I agree with uh, Ms. Deb saying the percentage are deceptive um, and the experiences aren't fully counted. And so that would be my two cents for today. We might be as high as 6%. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Guthrie. And just so you know, we are having a focus group, a small focus group with African, with black students at NAU as well, because they are a huge portion of, of Flagstaff's economy, uh, in particular, especially when school is in, and they're a large part of the community that we want to make sure and recognize. Kara, I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you to everyone who was able to join us this evening and participate. We want to thank uh, Pastor Richard for uh, providing us with the framework for this narrative and, and helping us to get into this conversation. Uh, as Ms. Teb said, uh, and as uh, Mr. Brown noted, this is just the first of a series of conversations that we're going to be having. The next one is scheduled for this Saturday at 4.30 on representation and preservation uh, as we continue the conversation. After that, we'll uh, move into next week where we'll have the presentation on youth issues and concerns on the 24th and a presentation on economic inclusion and impact on the 26th. Uh, as always, if you have further comments that you would like to share with us uh, as part of this group, um, and this ongoing conversation, please feel free to email us. You can email flagstafflivedblack or at gmail.com. I'll share that email address in the comments for folks. And uh, just to close this out, again, thank you all for participating. We look forward to engaging with you uh, in the future and ongoing as part of this conversation. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, everybody. You. Adios. Thank you, everyone.